Today on Roundtable Perspective, Pim and Rami joins me in examining what difference it makes if there's black filmmakers, black casting directors or not in the entertainment we see. Pim and Rami has been making films since he was 14. He's won awards, including most recently the African Choice Award for his film 93 Days. We will be discussing the relationship between film and social justice in the world we live in. Join me on Roundtable Perspective. Welcome to Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Payman Rami, um, to discuss filmmaking and the uh, condition of the world in which we live. Let's make it, <laughs> let's make it broad. Um, no, I really think that we'll be able to. Uh, Payman Rami is a um, distinguished and um, long career in filmmaking, directing, educating. He has been making films, I think, since you were 14. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to very quickly talk about a few of the awards that you've received. The American Advertising Federation, International Television Association, the, uh, the Key to the City of New York, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chicago African American Arts Alliance, and 93 Days, which was just ended its run in London about the Ebola crisis in uh, Nigeria, won the African Choice Award and the African Academy Award. Uh, also, I, I assume that I've missed many, but uh, I well, think that's close that, that, that's something that we can um, start with. So, uh, actually, I would like you just to maybe recap what 93 Days was about. We can begin with that. Why did you decide to make that particular film at that particular time? I was in Nigeria, actually on vacation, and it was the 40th anniversary of my wedding. We, we decided to go to Nigeria. To the same woman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We've actually been working together for 50 years. Oh, we goodness. met in high school. I had a, a touring production company and I went to her high school to perform and uh, met her there. She was in charge of the, the Black Student Organization and we started working together right after that and been working together ever since. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but 93 Days, I was in Nigeria and met the producing team and um, they asked me would I be interested in, in producing it. And I read the script, and it was a, the kind of story that I'd be proud enough to associate with. And so I agreed to go back and spend the three months there shooting it. And the story was about the doctor. It's, a, it's about a patient from Liberia that lands in Lagos and tells them that he has malaria, mm -hmm. but it turns out to be Ebola. And when they got him in the hospital, they didn't let him out. He was, he was a diplomat. He was supposed to speak at the International Convention. But these doctors sacrificed their lives to make sure that it didn't spread around the world. And I don't know how many of the students here or members of your, your crew would come to work if they knew that someone with Ebola was here. Yeah. But these doctors did. And so it's that story. It's a, it's a dramatization. It's not a documentary. Uh, Danny Glover plays the principal doctor that owned the facility where they took the patient. And we shot it for three months. And 93 days is the amount of time that it took for it to be announced that they had it and for them to announce that it was no longer an issue in Nigeria. Um, the incubation three and months, the yeah, period of it was 93 months, yeah. days, yeah. Um, and it was well received. It hasn't opened in the U.S. yet. It's uh, We've opened only around done the world and showed right. in countries in Africa, but not... Yes. Not in this one. We were invited by the CDC to show it in Washington. Um, we, we were at the Toronto International Film Festival, Chicago International, the Pan-African Film Festival in LA, the uh, festival in Brookshire, um, Minnesota, Massachusetts, and a couple more. I think we did Boston. So you producing that film sounds slightly like serendipity. You happen to be there. They talk to you. but. Other than that, how would you make decisions over what film you want to either write or produce or direct? Because your, your background has been one, not just making films since you were 14, but also involved in efforts for social justice and equality. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you combine those two? How do you decide, I want to make this film? I make the choices based on my great-grandchildren that I haven't met yet. Uh, and I say that seriously. Because 
I make the, when I read a script or when I do a play or if I'm doing a book or whatever the case might be, I look at it and say, is it something that would go into a time capsule and that my great-great-grandchildren would see and I'd be proud enough for it to, to yeah. be yeah. the representation, of, the last representation of me. And so those, that's how I make choices. And there are a lot of projects that I don't do because they wouldn't live up to well, that. Let me push that a little bit more because I could imagine some famous comedian that would want to make a f film that was like, you know, one of those donkey films or whatever, where it's just complete slapstick and whatever. But your films are entertaining, but they're not um, on serious, I guess that would be. So why would you, because you certainly want to be entertaining, otherwise people aren't going to see the film. But how does it move from something that's just, for lack of a better way, pure entertainment, mm -hmm. and something that is entertaining but also speaks to the human condition? I'm a storyteller first, uh, and a communicator before anything. And I realized early in life that people needed communicators. They, they needed people that could create to tell their stories. And so when I realized that, I, I, I realized that I wasn't limited to film or television. I produced over 300 industrial medical films. I did the first open heart surgery. Uh, did a series of films, on, on birthing films. Designed the television system for Cedar sinai Medical Center and produced uh, the first project on the uh, uh, tennis elbow operation. Oh my. Um, so, you know, my, my projects have been based on what is it that I want to communicate and some of those have nothing to do with film. I did a piece on, on the, hip film replacement. The, the film is the medium, but they it's don't the medium, have, yeah. yeah. I did okay. a piece on the hip replacement, which I felt was extremely important. Uh, one of the projects I did was called It's Okay to Say No Way or the Case of the Unwanted Pregnancy, oh, yes. which I did for Planned Parenthood in 1980. And it became the precursor for the Say No campaign which most people, I will never get credit for that, but it was that music piece that Nancy Reagan saw when she started her campaign with Planned Parenthood. Yeah, yeah. So um, some of those projects have been much more important to me in the long run, but there are a lot of comedies that I, I won't do yeah. because at the end of the day, you know, what is the value? You well, know, there's a difference between the comedy like Dick Gregory or even a Richard Pryor and okay. a, a comedy that has a, a, almost a mean edge or a... I mean, I have no problem with silliness, but sometimes, um, whatever it is, there's a there's a there's a social uh, value or a judgment that's involved. And, and uh, if you're not always aware of that, whether it's uh, the say no or the hip replacement, yeah. um, it, it, it can leave a different um, impact on the viewers. Some of the the comedies that are done are slapstick stupidity, and then some are intelligent comedies. Yeah. I prefer the intelligent comedy. It, it can be funny. I, mean, I think people's lives require comedy. Yeah. You know, in relationships, they, they require there to be a breath of air that comes about as a, as a result of just having simple joy mm -hmm. in your life. And too many of us don't. And so I prefer doing those projects at the end of the day where people are going to walk out and feel good at the end of it, they're gonna feel accomplished. They're gonna yeah. feel that this is something that was important yeah. and they, I didn't waste their two hours. They'll remember it tomorrow or the next week. It's not yeah. like something like a piece of fluff that it was enjoyable or titillating for the moment, but I can't recall it uh, later on, so. And I like the superhero movies. I mean, for the most part, I think that they're basically eliminating a lot of other films that should be done, but I have no problem with the Avengers and the Justice League, and you know I think that people go to see those and they enjoy them and they have fun for the day. But there's a room for this, for this story that will motivate a young child to have a better relationship with their family, mm -hmm. to to have a commitment to the community in which they live. That we are me, obligated that... to make the earth a better place than when we inherited it. That's one of the things that impresses me about your work, maybe not the hip replacement, but I mm -hmm. even see a socially responsible, socially useful uh, consequence for that. Um, 
but when you talk about uh, the child making a better relationship with their parents or a better uh, connection with the community, it kind of uh, marks what you've been doing since you were 14, 15, 16 and mm -hmm. uh, being part of the, uh, the civil rights movement of the time and maintaining that now through um, questions of equality and access to health care even with the Ebola crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of that is demonstrated, one of the things I didn't include in the introduction is the work that you've done with the DuSable. You're also an educator yes. and you develop programs at the DuSable. Were there those primarily art-based, uh, creative-based, or were there other parts of the programs that you did? Um, you, you know, I, I had a car accident in 1982 and I was on crutches for three years. But it was at the advent of the computer, and I was forced to sit down. And because of that, I learned every program imaginable. So when I got out of that, I was well equipped to run a multi-million dollar production facility that had everything from satellite uplink to telemedicine, I designed telemedicine projects. A lot of that had to do with the fact that I was hurt. Mm -hmm. Well. My, my point about this is that when we have the opportunity to create, um, we have an obligation to decide what is it that we can do to improve the quality of someone's life in the process of the things that we produce. And so I, I, I've successfully been able to do that. I did a project called Mother, which was about a 14-year-old that committed suicide because of bullying. We did that ages ago. Um, but it was an important piece to do. We did a musical piece called uh, The Spider and the Fly, which was about a, a, a fly whose mother didn't want her to date the spider, <laughs> but she refused to listen to her mother. And in the end, the spider killed her because that's what sp spiders do. But it was, a, it was a, a, a well done piece that we designed for young people. Was this um, at the yeah. DuSable? Was this, this was part before of the, the DuSable. At the okay. DuSable, my, my focus there was twofold. I produced all of their programs, but the things that I'm most proud of is the interdisciplinary African and African American curriculum that we developed for the state and for the, and for CPS. Um, oh, is it used in the 200, schools? 250. It? Well, it's all on their, their knowledge center. Okay. You know, and we and we did training for the principals and for and for uh, uh, teachers. Uh, this is with Barbara Bird Bennett, and right after that, she ended up being you know convicted. Uh, so I'm not sure how far they went with it, but we developed it. Was that it for the, the history classes, or would that have been in the, the art cross, curriculum, it was or was the cross, inter, you said interdisciplinary? Everything. So we teachers everything. would have access to that to be able to bring it into their... Yeah, and it's over 250 lessons that are on their knowledge center that they can, they can pull down. So that was one of the projects. We did a, a project called the Google Classroom, where we, we, we created these training programs on Chicago history that were connected to 10 schools at one time. And they could simultaneously ask questions of the other students mm -hmm. and interface with our staff. So I was uh, concerned about using all of the skills that I had uh, in that environment. We created two Civil War reenactments with cannons in the North fighting the South and uh, projects around Mary Bowser, who was, one, who was a uh, spy in the Confederate White House. Um, so we did all of these projects as part of the history. We, we did a, I did a play called um, uh, Broccoli Has a Good Day. Uh, and it was about a little broccoli who didn't want to stay in the vegetable bin but wanted to hang out with meat and yeah. the other folks. And it was, again, an educational project for young people. And we had schools that were bust in to see that. Well, that kind of leads to a larger question. You've bumped up against it. Uh, mm -hmm. what, is the, what do you see as the role of film, or how did you see the role of film to contribute or to intervene or to advance whatever social movement, whether it was around educational uh, improvement in the schools or questions of health care. I mean, because we usually look at film, unless it's a documentary, but otherwise we see film as something that's entertainment. How do you, again, how do you put that film and production with uh, yeah. some sensibilities for making a better world? You know, I, I have never seen film as just being entertainment. Uh, I think that there's some entertainment values and that creatively you have to tell a story in a way that people want to see it. But on the other hand, I've always felt that the, that the role of media in general is to inform people 
and to improve the quality of life. If you start there, then you begin to look at, well, well how do I create things that educate young people about uh, the facts of life? Is there, is there any room for just like expression, like outrage? I, I'm, I'm thinking like hip hop, and before hip hop, you could have said rock and roll and other genres, certainly, that um, the, the people that are, that are producing them, young people in general, are not I mean, you, you obviously were more uh, aware when you were a teenager, but that was a different, uh, what, cultural, social climate. But is there a space for someone just to express their, what, <laughs> nihilist or anger or outrage at the conditions I find myself in and just kind of, well, forget you, this is what I'm doing, um, as an expression? I, I think the artist has a couple of responsibilities. One is to be a reflection of life and where they are. And I think when you look at hip hop, a lot of the people that are in hip hop are basically reflecting what they see in the streets yes. and what they see around yes. them. So in, it, in that case, they're basically storytellers. Yes. Right? Okay, so that's one thing, just to, to give an education about what is. The second is to create the environment that will allow you to perpetuate what the future ought to be. So that you're creating an environment where young people are saying, this is how things should be in our lives. The because you can do that too. Yes, the, the question, it seems to me, popular culture, again, it's not just music, but it's in other, other art forms, including television and film. It's like the idea that something could be different or something, the world that you want, doesn't seem to be an option. It doesn't seem to be a possibility. It's all, I mean, and I'm not, I mean, <laughs> I know you did a show interview with a cop, but when I think about cops in Chicago, I don't think primarily as Joe Friendly. I think somebody drive by going to arrest kids because there's three of them on the corner and it's against the city ordinance. It's gang activity. Mm -hmm. um, so in that climate, I see that the music is, we don't like this, whatever epithet I will use. But for that experience in that community to be able to see that something else is possible, that there's another option. How can that come from that, what, that um, creative place? Who, who, who can help with that creative place? I did it. I had a program called the Teen Talk Radio Theater, which we did for about eight years. And some of the this leading... This was, was on the radio? This was on radio. Okay. Yeah. Where, where did uh, it? It was on WHBK and also on KKC. Okay. And we broadcast every week for almost eight years. Um, Jamal Green was part of that group. Um, Chance the Rapper was part of that okay. group. Um, and some of the top producers now. Yeah, I don't mean to impugn all the hip hop because there are some that are obviously quite politically conscious. But. So but my point <laughs> is that I think my obligation as a mentor was basically to show them how to look out of a window. Because when you look out of the window, you can choose what you focus on. You can either see all the garbage on the street or you can see the leaves and the, and the flowers blooming. It's your opportunity to decide what is it that you see and then what is it that you want to perpetuate. And so, yes, some people look out of that window and they talk about the ugly. Some people look out of that window and they find the good. And so as artists, and even in, in hip hop, you have both of those sides. You have the artists that are seeing the bad, you have the artists that are seeing the good. The studios, however, in the music oh, yeah, business, yeah. What are they choose do? to push the negative more than they push the positive. Yeah. And we have to search out those artists that are doing the things that are the most important and most effective for us. It would seem like, and that's when I think of the Dusable or the Teen Talk, that mm. the, um, there needs to be a voice or an experience that can draw attention. Because even if I look out the window, depending on the window, there may be more ugly than not. What happens with what you can do or what others can do is say that's not the only window that you can yeah. look you, out You of. know, I think part of the problem is that we, we face a, an industry that even when you're doing something that is like that, that is positive, will say it's an it's a abnormality. Yeah. And so you can have a, a, a really successful, well done comedy that is positive and it can make millions and millions of dollars. 
and people will not pick that up and go and do another one. Yeah. I think the responsibility of the citizen and the viewer is to turn off that which is negative and, and search out that that is positive. And also, we don't write enough. You know, we don't complain enough in advance. We don't, we don't write positive reviews of things. You know, so if there's a show on and you like it, write about it. Yeah. Send something in. Don't wait until it's taken off the air <laughs> and then write and say, and I'm disappointed. After and the then fact. protest yeah, after yeah. the fact. Yeah, we need to be much more supportive up front. And there were, there were a number of institutions, many more during the 60s and 70s, where you could go in and you could have discourse about, you know, the qualitative issues and social justice and all of that. And a lot of those institutions no longer exist. Yeah. And so we have to do a lot more searching. Create a space for that. Yes, we do. Um, I'd like to end, we have a limited amount of time, but I'd like to end, uh, we talk a little bit about the South Shore Festival and a couple of entries that you had that I think are doing just what you said is the uh, responsibility and also the reward for a, for a uh, filmmaker. Um, interview with a cop and also 19 in a day. We may not be able to talk about both I, I, of them, but maybe yeah. one you could. I'll do them really quickly. 19 in a day uh, is a story of a, a young hip hop artist, uh, Hispanic, who was killed the day after his 19th birthday on his way to do a major concert, his first major concert. And it's actually a love story about how the community saved his mother and father, who were going to commit suicide together. And because of the, the community showed all this love for him and for them, they didn't do it. And now they're social justice advocates themselves. An example of, here's the ugly, but here's an option. And this is a way forward. I like that. Yeah. Okay. And, and they're going around, and they're showing it at schools, and they're, they're interfacing with gang members, and they're talking about and, and reflecting on the damage that you do to families and communities when you take a life. And so that's one. The other in the interview with the cop is about a former member of the Black Panther Party who became a homicide detective for 23 years. In Chicago? In Chicago. And what his feelings are, are from fighting on both ends yeah. of, of the clock. And it's an incredible film. I think I need to see that because I can I, I mean, my visceral responses I can't imagine. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that. Maybe uh, we can set up a showing. And because um, I, I mean, when you say Chicago cops and the Panthers, I think of Fred Hampton and and the assassinations and that whole history. So this would be a, um, interesting to see how somebody came came to uh, came and, to grips with that. So. And for for young filmmakers. The challenge for them is to find the story of the new Fred Hampton. Yep. Like, like how, how does Fred become Fred? Yeah. And, and what are the, who are those young people that we should be focusing on and getting behind and pushing and supporting? Because you have to have a voice that's out to, I to wanna, change I, I want to end with that. I think I told you before I, I saw this report from... Uh, Harvard economist that pointed out the number of people that get patents is not based on how well they did in math or science and the exceptional students, but it had more to do with their social class and race background. And the argument was, we lose these Einsteins, or in this case, mm -hmm. we're losing the filmmakers, we're losing the storytellers because they need that opportunity. So I'm, again, I want to applaud for what you've done and what you continue to do. Um, but I think that we're out of time. Um, yes, <laughs> we, I, guess, I, I guess we're close to being out of time. So. <laughs> well, um, you, you know, I, I'll, I'll close with this final comment. I, I did a music video for the Department of Education called Follow Your Dream. And the tagline was, first you have to see it, then you can be it. And so young people have to, to know that there is a possibility that I can become whatever I yeah. want to. Because here's examples of people that were in my same state of being that became something and I can do the same. I would, I would add to that by saying that it's possible to live well by doing good. Mm. You've had a successful career in filmmaking and, and, but not by sacrificing or trying to become the uh, film entrepreneur and, f and chasing the audience, but actually presenting the audience with a perspective and uh, um, exceptionally well done at that. So I would Absolutely. say we can live well by doing good. So yeah, most certainly. You're and, a testimony to that. So. And on every project we do, we hire young people that we mentor on those projects. Okay. So when I went to Nigeria, I took a young filmmaker from here with me. 
Pem and Rami, uh, people will be looking you up. That's all the time we thank have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pemin, for uh, joining me today on Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. See you next time.